Hey guys, happy Thanksgiving. And um, as today is Thanksgiving, I wanted to broach on a little bit of a different subject. You know, in this channel, um, Uncle Dwayne's Watch List, we talk about fundamentally sound stocks, which are at or at or near their annual low price and how we can make money by taking advantage of those opportunities. Today, I wanted to touch on the subject of what... I, I've known many people in the Christian community who I consider very intelligent in many ways when it comes to religion, when it comes to things of the world, but when it comes to things regarding money or finances, um, I would say I find them a little challenged in their thinking. So today I wanted to broach on a subject of what the Bible says concerning money and i know i have people who listen to this channel who are not necessarily christian they may be of other faiths on um, what i would say to you i can remember years back i was doing a seminar it was not here it was in tanzania and it was um, actually most of it was translated into Swahili because not everybody understood English. But the thing that was great about that seminar is that it was done for seven days and it was being conducted in a church. But there were about half as many Muslims there as there were. Christians, because there we weren't there to dispute what our faith was or what we believed or whatever. We were just speaking simply about money and finances and financial opportunities. And so here I'm reaching out to the Christian community to just present some things to them that I've discovered in my walk, but that's not a knock on any other faith. It's not a knock on any other community. In this channel, we talk about finances, plain and simple. This is just one video to the Christian community. Any others who want to listen to it, that's fine, but please don't be offended by this. This is one video to the Christian community just to give them a clearest perspective on how to look at things financially and how the Bible looks at things financially. So we're going to end up in the parable in Matthew, as you see. Um, presented on the thumbnail, but we want to go through a few other passages first. And we'll start with 1 Samuel chapter 2 7. And Hannah was praying, and she said, The Lord makes poor and makes rich, He brings low and lifts up. So, in, ev in other words, everything is in His hands and in his control. The next one we go to is Proverbs 10, 4 and 5. And it says, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. So in other words, the person 
who has a slack hand, they're being lazy, they're not doing the work or whatever, they become poor. But the person who's diligent, who's hardworking, the hand of the diligent makes rich. And he who gathers in the summer, in other words, a person who's making preparation early, is wise. But he who sleeps in harvest, the harvest is when you should be gathering and you're sleeping, causes shame. Now, we have to remember that Proverbs was written by either the king or prince to their son. So when you look at Proverbs, it's looking from the perspective of preparing the man because it was royalty writing to their son. And that's why it's using the male in a lot of instances. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Next, we come to Proverbs 10.22. And Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. So one thing that we're getting from these verses, one pattern that we're getting, is that God doesn't have a problem with riches. God doesn't have a problem with the Christian community having anything. Now, later on, we're going to see in which context he doesn't have a problem with it. But for now, we see he has no problem with it. And he's the one who may give the riches. Proverbs 21, 17. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. In other words, you're chasing after pleasure, whether it's fast money, women, whatever. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. In Proverbs 28, 20 and 22, we have these two verses. The first being, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich, fast money, will not go unpunished. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. So we see no problem with riches. We see no problem with money. But we see a problem with trying to attain fast riches, trying to short track or do illegal or unethical things to get that money. Now, we're going to get, we come to the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, 10, verses 10 through 13. And he says, But I rejoice, rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about the assembly showing their care for him in terms of sharing or giving finances. And then he goes on. Now, I'm reading from the New King James Version for any who say, well, my Bible doesn't say that or whatever. Depends on what version you're reading from. Not the King James Version. I'm reading from the New King James Version. But yours should basically be around the same thing. Maybe a couple of words are different. So he continues and says, 
Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And I I emphasize I have learned because a lot of people misunderstand this passage which is coming up. He says, I know how to be abased, meaning how to be low, and I know how to abound, how to have everything. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full, you have everything you need, you have all the riches you need, and to be hungry, you barely have anything both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've seen so many Christians who misunderstand that verse. They take that to mean, I can jump over a wall, I can do this, I can withhold any circumstance or whatever the case is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I've been in this Christian walk on both sides of the scenario, having everything that you could ever need and having nothing. It was a learning process. And I went through that learning process. And now at the end of that learning process, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever circumstance I find myself in, Christ is there and he's strengthening me to get through it. But in this passage, he's talking about finances. He's talking about money. And he's thanking them, thanking the um, local church for sharing with him. But he's saying, despite that, uh, it's not a need. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I've learned how to be abased. You have a lot of people who are poor. They've experienced having nothing but they've never experienced having everything. They can't handle that. You have a lot of people who have everything, but they've never experienced having nothing. They can't handle that. The Apostle Paul said, I've been through both experiences. Christ has strengthened me through all of it. I can handle all of it. Now let's go to... 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. Chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. For another passages that are commonly misunderstood. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And I want to emphasize a point. The Apostle Paul didn't say, um, wait, let me find the word. The Apostle Paul didn't say, for money is a root of all kinds of evil. He said, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. We need money to survive in this world. We need to pay bills. We need to live. There's things we need to obtain for life. Money is a medium of exchange. We don't have to love it, but we need money to to live. And as you're in your younger life, you have to work for money. 
But as you get older, that may not be as possible as it was in your younger life. So you want to spend your time in your younger life setting up your money so that it works for you. So that if you find yourself in a position where you can no longer go out and work for money, your money is still working for you and bringing in more money for you. So, having said that, let's get to the meat of this video, which is our passage in Matthew chapter 25, 14 through 30. And the Lord shares a parable with us. And it's, it reads, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Everybody's ability is not the same, so he gave each talents according to their own ability. Now, in this case, when we're reading about the talents, they're not talents like we think of today. Oh, I could sing, I can dance, whatever talents. These talents are a measure of money. So the master is going away. He gives money to each of them according to their own ability. It says, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it into dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Remember I told you talents was money, and here we see it. He who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So the Lord went away on a long journey. Now he comes back and he's settling accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, before we finish this, I want to point out a few things. I don't want to lose track of these messages that are coming from us. First off, or coming to us, first off, the Lord gave them the talents according to their ability. He gave one person five. He gave another person two. The guy who, or the person who he gave five, they brought back five more and they were commended for it. The person that he gave two, they weren't held to the same standard as the one who brought back five. 
they brought back two, they doubled. And they were commended for it. So, one, it's according to our own abilities. The other thing is that these people were stewards. In other words, the resources that was available to them, they realized that those resources weren't theirs. Those resources were the masters. And they were responsible for using those for the interest of the master. So there's things that we have every day, whether it may be a car, whether it may be a house, money, whatever the case is. What are we using that stuff for? Are we using that stuff just for us? Is it also used in the service of others. I've heard stories of people who had houses um, in the church and they would have kids regularly at their house doing activities with them and things of that case. Um, people who get a car, they make sure to help some of the people um, in the church who cannot get back and forth as easily on Sundays because they don't have transportation or whatever. So when we have money, do we look at ourselves as, oh, this is mine? Or do we see ourselves as stewards of what God has placed in our hand? In other words, a steward is a manager. It's somebody who's managing something for someone else? Do we see ourselves as stewards of what God's placed in our hands, or do we see ourselves as, oh, this is mine, which is a different perspective? So these are some of the lessons that we see coming out in these passages. But then we get to verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look. There you have what is yours. So it wasn't that he was a steward who stole his master's money. He was just a steward who held on to his master's money. He hid it in the ground. And we'll see what the, what the Lord said to him. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Notice. It wasn't give more to the one person who has nothing. It was to the person who has nothing and did not multiply anything, take it from him and give it to the one who had the most. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable, cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, just these few passages for us to look at 
the Bible and its perspective on money. There's not a problem with riches, and God makes rich. God expects us to be diligent. He expects us to be hardworking, but he doesn't expect us to be greedy. He doesn't expect us to be chasing after fast money. He expects us to be logical, rational, and hardworking and build up what we have and build up what we need. And he expects us to be stewards in terms of the money that's been placed in our hands. And so, guys, you can check into this channel every week. I go to go through this week's stock winners to show you fundamentally sound stocks. Fundamentally sound stocks, which are what? Which are companies. You're not gambling. You're investing in fundamentally sound companies which are building up from their annual low price. Every stock in the stock market, it has a low price for the year and it has a high price for the year. We want to get these stocks when they're at their low price and just hold on to them as they ride all the way up. And if we hold them for over a year, we have the best tax advantages. Because if we hold them for over a year, that's a long-term capital gain, right? Whereas if you're taxed at your normal rate, especially if you make a good income, you could be paying 30 or something percent a year in taxes. But those that you receive on fundamentally, the gains that you get on fundamentally sound stocks, which are long-term capital gains, those that you've hold or held over a year, are around 15%. And bear in mind, there's other videos I have on this channel where I speak about S-Block. S Block is a secured back line of credit. They I've known S Blocks open as small as twenty five thousand dollars, and when you have the S Block, you can now borrow up to seventy percent of your money at a very low interest rate, not have to make regular monthly payments because you have collateral against it, which is the stocks, and you still own your stocks while they're growing in value, okay? So I, I just wanted to drop this video, guys, and add a little spiritual perspective or biblical perspective on this subject of money, since that's something we cover in this channel. Okay, guys, have a great day, have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll speak to you in the next video.